Good morning, my beautiful friends. I hope that this um, this morning that you're feeling well, that you woke up, and uh, despite all the facts, all the things that are going on, and all the different situations that we are facing right now, that you've managed to find peace and calm and, and joy. Um, when I was speaking to one of our centre teams on uh, Friday during a call, um, I led us through an exercise which I did live actually here with Crystalyn. Um, when was it? Last week. And um, it's really just giving us permission to feel these feelings. So important that we have our, give ourselves the permission, the permission to feel exactly what we are feeling right now and not to try and shift it without recognizing it. And um, I know that, it, that, that the announcement of, of us opening at level three has evoked a lot of strong emotions. And a lot of you are tuning in right now in this, in, to this broadcast and you're looking for guidance and you're looking for, for facts and, and ideas on how to do this effectively. But if we don't take a moment of stillness to listen to what we're truly feeling, we kind of might get caught up in the stormy seas of public opinion. So let's take a second and uh, let's feel. Crystalline said so powerfully uh, that your body and your heart moves a lot slower than your mind. So wherever you are right now, I wanna invite you into this exercise. I want you to put your one hand on your heart, your other hand on your stomach. We're gonna take 30 seconds. And I want you just to take a big breath in to your heart center, into your heart. And as you breathe out, just let go and relax all the tension in your shoulders. And then just become aware of the emotion inside of you. Don't try and judge it or create a story, just feel, is it? One of the eight bedrock emotions, is it fear? Is it excitement? Is it sadness? Is it anger? Is it joy? Is it calm? What emotion are you feeling this morning? Some of the emotions that came up and that might come up for you might be something like, I feel scared. And then the trick is to connect that emotion that you're feeling to the unmet need, as we've been taught. I feel scared because I need, I, I have a need for security to keep my parents safe, my children safe. And if I go back to work, I might compromise my health, their health. Or perhaps it's I feel anxious because I have a desire for my own well-being and the thought of going back to work in poor conditions, it leaves me feeling scared. And I acknowledge that there are many of us who the thought of going to back to work to places that was not serving our well-being is a scary thought. Perhaps I feel excited and we've seen this come out because I have a desire for my own well-being. I mean, I have a desire and a need for connection with my families and I can't wait to see them again. All these plethora of emotions are okay, but the important thing is, is that we locate our own emotions, we give it our, uh, a name and we connect it to our needs. And for a lot of us, we'll be feeling some sadness and excitement. I um, have been thinking a lot of, of a story of, of uh, my dad and uh, when my brother was born, he was, um, my, my dad was actually, we were born in South Africa and my dad was uh, enlisted in the military and he was in the front line. So he wasn't around in those early years. And at 18 in South Africa, you had to enlist into the military. And that like, when, when I comprehended that thought as a child, like that scared the heck out of me. But in some way, it feels like um, as New Zealand tries to desperately start up our economy in this crisis and save as many jobs as possible, the government and the New Zealand people have called us somewhat to the front lines 
to be of service of essential workers and to those who um, have absolutely no alternative for childcare. And in the midst of our fears, it also gives us an opportunity to be courageous. And um, we know that when, when we switch into fear, uh, our entire nervous system switches into fight or flight. We become hyper vigilant for threat. So everything that we hear and we see feels magnified. And that fear can produce more fear. And our friend Tanya Valentin uh, this morning released a beautiful video where she said, you know, the only thing that's more contagious than coronavirus is our mindset. And um, it's there's a lot of truth to that. We get to choose how we show up. And this is what we've learned. We get to choose that regardless of the stormy seas, we cannot let our own internal world um, be at the mercy of the stormy seas behind, uh, around us. So I just wanted to lead with that and I wanted to acknowledge all the emotions that we're feeling. And um, I wanna thank you for, for those who are processing those and, and, and willing to show up mainly for the connection of our families and the support generally for like the country in a wider scheme. We do have Dr. Mike Bedford on the broadcast this morning, and I'm very excited to be talking to him and sharing. He, he is a deep thinker, someone who's got incredible amounts of experience in our industry. And um, so I do want to welcome Dr. Mike Bedford to our show. Welcome. Oh, Marina, um, yeah, Marina, Rick, thank you for having me on. And it's, I've been looking forward to this, it's great. Yeah, yeah. we have a unique opportunity um, to discuss these things together as Fano, We've got a lot of uh, families, I mean, a lot of teachers in that industry here thinking together and discussing and, and connecting to our hearts. So um, it feels like the right time to mm. um, be having the discussion that we're about to have. Let's do a small adjustment there. Am I... <laughs> Oh, well, anyway, let's take that a bit. Lovely view of my kitchen sink. Me and the kitchen sink. Oh, you're a little, there you go. That, uh, the important thing is, did, did, you get your, did you get your cup of tea before we started? Uh, yes, yes, I have that right here. So I have voice lubricant. That's good. Um, actually, I will just adjust that again slightly. Uh, yeah, let's try that one. Uh, that might be where you are. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so look, one of the things I'm going to try and do here this morning is capitalize on this time. Uh, to enjoy myself a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm not a person who wants to be speaking into the negative, and that's what the situation has produced. Um, and it's, it's really not where I come from. And um, it's uh, one of the things, you know, we have, we have that saying, you know, sort of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, and what that means is that if you don't realise that something's broken, you're not going to give the attention it needs. But that doesn't mean the attention is negative. The attention can be absolutely wonderful. And so one of the things, I mean, what you've just said this morning is so, so good. And I've been taking that time this morning for myself because I needed to. And, um, yeah, so what I want to do is to take us into perhaps something of a better place than what we discuss and what we think, mm -hmm. um, to bring some background thought, a bit of history, and how the history shapes thinking and action in the early childhood space um, around around people, around human beings as beings, you know. So it, it should be really should be really good. So yeah. your, your your passion really give us a bit of a background of you know a lot of us may have only just heard of you because um, you you know sometimes I call it kind of divine timing you've you spoke the right word in the right season which captured the attention of um many many people mm -hmm. um but when we started having a conversation and um your your name kind of fortuitously came up during our Kimberly Crisp broadcast mm -hmm. um which for me just gives all the right aligned pointers that there's something more going on and when I really started reading your your research and the place that you're coming from I I was very, very excited, and um, and so give the viewers a little bit of an idea, both of like the history that you come from and how you've come to think and be involved in this space. Right. Okay. Um, well, it's interesting because um, I've come from a public health background. Um, my qualifications in public health. So I'm not a medical doctor, 
Um, my doctorate is in public health and my master's in public health. And um, in, the, in the 80s, I worked in environmental health, health protection, and that's very much an inspection-based practice. And uh, while I love the science, I'd have to say the, the model of working jarred with me a little bit. And the interesting thing is the role that I've just picked up with Massey, yesterday was my work, first day of work with Massey. Right. right. Uh, it's interesting times. Today is my day off and I'm back to work tomorrow because it's three days a week. All at but, home. Yeah, um, all at home. But, um, but that role is actually as tutor for environmental health. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to it. It gives me the connection into the science base. And then what I do with that information, wherever I can get it from, whether it's doing a PhD or my role with Massey, and I'm really looking forward to engaging people with people in the learning space. But I can take that science and I can translate it into the knowledge of the sector. Mm -hmm. um, but back when I was doing this role, um, back in the 80s, I realised that the thing that was often missing was that application of science to people, that you had to connect with where people were at. Um, and so when in the early 90s, I, um, and that the critical role there was I was um, responsible for outbreak investigation for the Wellington region. So these were all the non-vaccine preventables. Um, and to be honest, non-vaccine preventable disease transmission is really neglected in public health. Um, if it's vaccine preventable, it will get a lot of attention and resource. But the things that have to do with people's behaviours, things down to stuff like hand washing or to the design of a tap handle, now, it doesn't get much attention. But it fascinates me. That was my interest. And right. so what I discovered is that my work was um, largely <laughs> with early childhood centres. It completely surprised me. I knew nothing about this before. And, and so... Um, as I started working to that space, I, I discovered several things. What first thing I discovered was that the regulations didn't work. Um, so when you're dealing with a gastroenteritis outbreak and you find that there's one wash-in basin to 15 children, and then you realise that that comes from uh, public building legislation. How many, how many people need to use the toilet at one time? So how many basins do they use? It, it doesn't relate to early child education at all. So this first pointer, 1992, was that we had regulations that were not written for the context. And then the next thing I discovered is that in this inspection-based process, you know, when, when the health department, well, we haven't actually even had a health department since about 1988, but the health person comes in and everyone's on the edge and I'll know what they're gonna say. And what I discovered is that the teachers just really wanted help. These are not people who needed to be inspected and told what to do in a, in a, in a kind of regulatory way. There were people who just really wanted support. So I thought, how can we help here? What can we do? Another thing I discovered, um, and this was in the context of a Giardia outbreak in Paikok Riki, um, where we, we have this mythology around Giardia. It's, it's, this is not just New Zealand, it's certainly New Zealand, but it's international, that says Giardia comes from contaminated water. Well, it can. But I'll just give you a squidgy little insight into the balance here. This is relative risk assessment. What we've just had happen in the country, by the way, is an absolute failure of relative risk assessment. And that's what everyone can see so plainly. Can you but, just... Uh, yeah. Uh, should I just find that? Like, uh, yeah. when you say that we've had a failure of relative risk assessment, um, yeah. you know, in your mind, you're like, because this and this and this, I think we're all like, uh, I think we're doing okay. You know, so help us understand what that means. It's weighing up one kind of risk against another kind of risk. Where is the balance of the problem okay so in the case of Giardia, Giardia was a really good example we tested the water for Paikokariki and it was Giardia contaminated but all the cases in the town were related at that time to the play centre now I can say the safety now because it's 1992 and I'm not going to offend anybody right <laughs> but um but if you in the water now, Giardia is a hundredth of a millimetre in size. This is, it's like a, a cyst, and it's like an egg, basically. It's like a Giardia egg, tiny little thing. And you can, we had 10 of those in a tonne of water. A child with a Giardia infection can pass 100 million Giardia cysts in one bowel motion. Relative risk? Mm -hmm. Okay. But all the attention from the Ministry of Health was on the water, and it still is. 
even in research that shows right. that the benefit centres are very likely to be the reservoir for a lot of GRU in the country, even in a study that showed all this, at the end of the study, the authors said, well, we've got to put a lot more attention onto water. <laughs> so it's actually a mindset. We're up against mindsets in this. And I was learning this. But, okay, so much for that. That's hygiene. But the next thing that happened is I started engaging with early child education because I'm, I'm so interested in human development, just in people. And when I found Tafadiki, I thought this is the best government-level document I've ever seen in my life. I agree. And I was also starting to go along to early childhood conferences because at this point I was looking to set up it was in the process of setting up the Wellington Regional Public Health Program for early childhood centres. We'd never had a program like that in the country, but I saw the need and I was so interested. You know, and I thought it wouldn't matter what my job was. This is fascinating. I love this stuff, you know. Um, and so that was a joy. And so that public health program had as its foundation that you can't do health and early child education unless you understand early child education in which case you have to understand children and teachers and parents. And now I'm going to add two more things to that. Um, well, actually, there was one that was added very, very early on as I started learning to the space, that you have to understand the rich range of approaches and philosophies, the phenomenal diversity in the sector. Right. That you need to learn that if you're going to engage with the sector. So that was, for me, a great learning journey, was immersing myself in those different philosophies. What is Montessori? Um, you know, what was any practice something and so on. Um, but, um, but the other that's really, really important now is the commercial and employment context. It has had massive impact on the sector. So we will talk a little bit into that. Mm -hmm. um, but that was not so much a factor in the mid-90s. Um, so that wasn't part of my early context. Mm. Um, yeah, so then in discovering Te Whariki, I, I was matching things up. I was looking at what was going on and thinking, have we got this right? And the thing I realised, and it was part of some of the, the 90s presentations that myself and my um, team I didn't have a team until about 1998. <laughs> but um, looking at the well-being strand in Tafariki and saying what we've done here is we've ripped it out of the Tafariki and we've called it health and safety. Interesting. So um, what happens when you pull a strand out of the Tafariki? Falls apart. It's bleeding. Yeah, it's going to fall apart, isn't it? Mm. And that's what was happening is the Tafariki was falling apart because that foundation of well-being had been turned into health and safety. It's such an interesting point because uh, when we think about health and safety, we we tend to um, have a somewhat of a cold emotional connection with it. It's yeah. <laughs> because it feels like, I don't know, it feels kind of like the laboratory that, that we need to keep clean. But when we start to think about well-being, it, it, it evokes a completely different emotional response yeah. into how we think and how we go about creating those yeah absolutely and so i'm going to step back a little bit from that the the original fariki was developed um in maori it was national tika hungaro trust um, people involved with the trust and that strand that's called well-being mm -hmm. was originally mana atua and mm -hmm. it i mean mana atua that doesn't translate very well, and especially um, in a secular society. Um, now, I want people just to give me a little space around this for my own interpretation here, um, because it's really, um, I, can, I can understand the, the meaning behind mana atua, but to some extent this was developed in the concept of um, a Maori cosmology, and one of the things that I need to mention, and, and I think it's really important right the way through the sector with our different philosophies. Someone actually popped this up on um, Facebook the other day of, the, of working with different philosophies and um, spirituality, mm -hmm. is that um, there are some logical limits around what you do where you need to look at people's integrity and what they understand. 
So um, for me, um, I'm a monotheist, I'm Christian. And so if you look at um, the logic of um, theism, you can have no God, one God, many gods, mm -hmm. and each of those positions is mutually exclusive to the others. You right. can't hold any two of them together rationally. I'm going to go Spock for a moment because I've been, you know, easing my mind with early Star Trek. Right. <laughs> right. What that means is that as a Christian, um, as a monotheist, I can't look at Mana Atua in a um, multiple God context. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not a. It's not a prejudice. It's. It's the position that I come from and my understanding of the universe. But in that understanding, oh my goodness, there's a beautiful thing in Mana Atua, the spark of godliness as it was put to me from one of the, the people who, was, who developed us. And, and that's what I see. You know, if, if there was only one human being ever made, one person on the planet, they would be the most complex thing in the known universe short of God. That's, we are astounding beings, every single one of us and so complex and that's the start of the fadiki is right. this is the development that fadiki is the most phenomenal human development model it's it's actually not an educational model it's a human development model and that's why it's guidelines for curriculum it's not curriculum it's guidelines for curriculum because it's the human development model behind the curriculum so, so when you under fadiki, then you get the curriculum so when you, uh, what you're saying is that the image that we hold of each other in, in our in our tamariki, when we come from that image that that we are all what you said the, the sparks of the divine that we hold mm. the power yeah. and of 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 well being and and creativity within us, then that's going to frame how we create everything around that as a foundation yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. Because one of the things I want to point to in that, I mean, for me. This is um, human beings in the image of God. So mm -hmm. two characteristics. Yeah. One of them is creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, there's, no matter how we spin it, there's no creature on this planet that comes anywhere remotely near to a human being for creativity. We are ridiculously creative. Mm -hmm. How many thoughts are there? You know, um, look at the way we decorate our toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, we can't help ourselves. So this is an innate drive in all of us, even those who think we're not creative, actually we still are. But the other thing is love. Mm -hmm. So love, um, the relationships that we have. Now, yes, the, there are relationships in, in non-human creatures, but of course there are, I know that, but, but we have a capacity in relationship and a capacity in love that is astounding. And that's also the core of the funny key. That's that's well being. Well being is love is well being, you know, in many, many respects. Um, so that's where the culture of kindness. Um, one thing I love is I work from C.S. Lewis's um, Love Does Not Disdain the Smallest Kindness. That's love in the detail. That's the love that where well, you know that one person, that's relationship. I'm going to connect out from this because this goes to ratios. Mm -hmm. There's a connection out, um, right. but the foundation. So, uh, what? What? I mean, I think what you're saying is really enlightening in terms of how we view health and safety. And so, this is where we're going to land land the the conversation in in some time. Is that mm -hmm. uh, unless we really understand what we're working within the context of the farihi and the context of of well being, uh, we can never make informed decisions that uh, around the health and safety of our workplaces. Absolutely. Um, so you, you've got, this is the context. Um, so, yeah. Um, so Sorry, now help, us, help us link link that in. Okay, so that's, I, yeah. I think you've done a wonderful job at painting that, that picture and, and giving us an understanding of where you're actually coming from. Yeah. Um, so help us understand what you've noticed in our sector that is contrary to the original intent of well-being. Okay. Um, I was just going to go to a little illustration here because for me, one of the first things I engaged with was hand washing. Right. That's the topic for the moment, isn't it? It is. Um, so the first thing that I noticed 
was that um, the as soon as you went to children's hygiene, like hand washing, we threw the fudiki out the window, and we did health and safety. We told children they have to wash their hands. You'd have the instructions coming from public health. You must make sure your children wash their hands. Okay, really? Um, and I looked at the design of the um, facilities. Yes, facilities. Um, basin, basin. Okay, taps that children couldn't work. Um, and then we got them replaced with automatic taps. Why? Well, because the children couldn't turn the taps off because they were the wrong taps. But I looked at this and I thought, this is not the funny key. Now, to illustrate, um, if you want someone to tell you what to do, when to do it, 50 million times a day, whether you want to hear it or not, get a four-year-old. They love it <laughs> because they love to tell you that they know the rules. Don't confuse this with compliance. It's got nothing to do with that <laughs> um, any more than being a lawyer means you want to obey the law. Um, okay, but for children, that time, particularly around three, four, five years old, is their learning time for the societal rules. They're learning this is how we do things. This is how we roll. This is the way it's done. And they love to say, I know how to do that. Oh, and I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. And, oh, you're not doing it right. You know, um, and I remember moving a car in a camping ground with, um, you know, I was moving it about, you know, like 20 metres or something. <laughs> and and uh, I think the, I think it was three at the time, a child decided to pop into that seat for a moment just while I moved the car. But then it was like, um, first problem, there's no um, child seat here, but next thing, you haven't got your seatbelt on. <laughs> so they know the rules. So yeah. for hand washing, if you can get your four-year-olds to engage with how important this is and why we do it, they'll run your culture for it. They will be the best health police on the planet. If you have your, if get, first of all, I mean, one of the first things that we started promoting was get rid of those basins. And we went to the, to the hand washing trough, which might seem a little less aesthetic looking, but it's practical in the sense that it's much harder to flood a, a hand washing trough than the basin. Mm -hmm. um, you can get more taps in, so you can increase from you know one to fifteen to maybe one to ten. But the soft side of it is you can make that place beautiful. So you make that room is as much a part of your early child education as any other room. Make it beautiful for goodness' sake, and put a mirror there because there's a whole different thing going on for a child when you have a mirror doing hand washing. This is not dress up. This is there's me. With my buddies, I'm in the belonging of doing this together and we're washing our hands and that's me doing it. It's huge reinforcement, but it's also part of that context of being in a family belonging with others. If you design it that way, if you run it that way, so you just see this is the fadiki. Mm -hmm. um, we're not doing health and safety in that clinical way anymore. You can say exactly the same around nappy change. Um, my colleague, um, Kerry Sutherland, um, referred to it as a date with a child. Nice. So one of the things that has really upset me is seeing assembly line nappy, nappy change. And one of the things that happens for me when I go into an early childhood centre space, or the way it's been, is that very few people would think I'm noticing this. So when I was doing my research, I could walk in to change the temperature monitor tag on the wall. And that's the guy from the university who comes in to change the battery on the temperature monitor. Nobody changes what they do. The environment's running as the environment does. I have a view that Aero can't get, um, which means I see beautiful things, and it means sometimes I see sad things. Um, but I can observe those things. I'll give you another example from popping in, and I think this was, again, to change a battery and a temperature monitor. And um, to give context, you, you've visited, uh, you said, I think over 700 centres, 1,500 visits. Like, right. you, you've probably got a range, uh, an understanding of the range of practices better than most. <clears throat> yeah, well, I've seen, yeah, seen so many things like that. One of the things that we did with the public health programme, by the way, which was key, um, we had to overcome the inspection thing. Mm -hmm. So in the public health unit, I said, 
don't you dare breathe the word inspection near my program. I will get very upset with you. <laughs> um, we're not doing that. This is to promote and protect and support people in public health. So we would work really hard to open up the relationship with centres before we went. We ran workshops. The beginning of our workshops, by the way, um, so we'd run that with, say, half a dozen centres in a group before we went and visited them. And the beginning is everything we say is challengeable because this was learning. This mm -hmm. is where so much of my learning came from was those workshops because every question, every challenge, you know, it's like the current situation, what you're saying that children won't spread this asymptomatically, where's your evidence? That's, I think that way now, of course. But we invited teachers to do that with us, to test everything, come up with a better method, better idea. So what happened then is I'd go along, I'd pay the visit, and for all that preparation, the first thing they would say is, what do you want to look at? I'd say, nothing, let's sit down and talk. Does you seem to have a special character? How's it going? After that conversation, people would take me through the centre and they'd show me all the things I never could have seen. They'd say, we're doing it this way, but we're not sure if it's right. Is this okay? Because they're not afraid anymore. We've got relationship, you know? That's the fadiki. It's the fadiki between the adults. So that was really, really good. But the thing I just wanted to touch on is um, popping in to change the temperature monitor. I had a chat with a girl who, uh, I'd asked her if she could show me where something was. I can't even remember what it was now. I just asked her for directions. And I engaged with a competent, confident learner. Well, this sounds good, doesn't it? Here's the goal of Tepadiki right here. But when I left, her face haunted me. There's something wrong. What is wrong with this child? And I realised that I wasn't looking at the face of a four-year-old. I was looking at the face of a jaded 40-year-old in an office who knows how the photocopier works and how to fix the thing and seeing the management come and go and is just getting through her day and she knows how to do this stuff. And, you know, I had a friend who relieved um, at that particular centre and I mentioned this interaction with a child and she promptly described this child to me because I hadn't given a description, a physical description, I just said this is the interaction. She said, oh, that'd be this, that'd be this girl, yeah. Um, you see, this is the problem, that we can fool ourselves in what we're doing when we start talking early child education. It's not just early learning. I'm very annoyed at that title, early learning because it doesn't take into account the fullness of human development. This is the fadiki. The fadiki is full human development. And the other thing I'd like to say is that we've had a form of insanity go through our academia in relation to early child education and child care, care of children, where they try to expunge the word development. No, we don't do that. We do early child education. That is insanity. And, and in in the submission to, uh, on the strategic plan, you do mention that that the early learning framework or the, the language needs to change to, to reintroduce early uh, learning and care environments rather than Absolutely. take the care aspect out of it because, again, we're, we're weaving. Yeah. And I think that's come out of our, our desire to be advocates that, that you know, our sector is not babysitters and we're not – we're not just there kind of like the advocacy to kind of bring the professionalism of the sector mm. up. But it seems that what you're saying is that it's swayed <laughs> completely to the, to, to the one side. Um, I, yeah, I want, I want to kind of, so let's break this really break it down into um, the areas of concern or the areas which you have seen where this is not being practiced. So you talk about group sizes, you talk about, yeah. Um, ratios and, and things that are that are on many of our hearts. Mm. Um, tell us why why do you see these as less than ideal practices currently, and what else have you seen that could work? Um, so I can just clarify that. So is, the, is this around practice, or is it around sort of the, the regulation context? Let's talk about regulation context right now in our sector. Okay. So if we roll back, we're going to do a quick little history of the development of these things. So. Mm. Our um, space requirements roll back to the mid-1980s to the Rogernomics era. Mm -hmm. And we saw space for children cut in 1985. Right. Um, 
But then, there, so there were, there were things going on that were not helpful to children, uh, very, very much a matter of economics of childcare. But we also had the promotion of early child education. And this is where this, this confusion over early learning childcare, um, the tendency that we have now to call any facility that meets the regulations that you can shove children into as long as it's got trained teachers is called early child education, even if it really isn't. So even if it's damaging their education, it's still called early child education. And this was the, the complete failure of, of, of the mistake with the participation drive. The quality wasn't mm. it. So what happened in, when, um, in the 1980s, you had play centre in kindergarten that were designed for early child education, sessional early child education. But you had children in, who were in full daycare and they couldn't access early child, educa early child education. So the decision was made that those children should be receiving early child ed education, even if they're in full daycare. So put the two together, ensure that an e all early childhood care has education. It was brought under the Ministry of Education. And so it wasn't calling child, here, child care early child education. It was saying it must be intrinsic to child care. It was a different way of looking at it. That was the beginning. What I think went wrong, so we had a really good thing. The thing that went wrong is that care was promptly forgotten. And so we, we were stuck with these poor quality regulations. As I said, some of it just designed from public building stuff, some of it driven by economics. And so one of the things that I saw in the 90s as I was getting to grips with this was how crowded the spaces could be. But it wasn't that bad then because so many, so many centres operated to better the minimum because most of them were set up for the benefit of children. And, and so people automatically didn't go to minimum space. But then we started getting a change. And this is the commercialization of childcare. So I want to be very clear about this, that um, I, it's interesting because there's one particular organization in the country that will tend to try and say that I and other researchers are biased. And in trying to find out what that bias is they're talking about, I haven't been able to get an answer. But um, one thing that I, because I certainly do have a bias, by the way, um, but my bias is not in relation to private ownership or community ownership or government ownership. Some of the most beautiful centres in the country are private ownership. But when you shift from the mechanism of private ownership for the benefit of children and communities and you respect your teachers as part of your community, that's very different to children as the bottom line on a balance, as, the, as just numbers on a balance sheet, leading to a commercial bottom line. That is what I have the bias against. When children and teachers are just a mechanism to make money, I am against that, clearly. So, and you, so you, know that you noticed a shift um, call it, and uh, you might be able to help me with the time frame where uh, <coughs> then kind of led to an exploitation for commercialization. Yeah. Um, the beginning of what I've termed the low quality growth based model began in the mid 90s. But it's just gathered strength since then um, with more players coming in on that basis. Um, some big, some small. Um, the size is not the, the, the key thing, it's what's your intent. But the last decade, I would say, is the decade of the commercialization of the early childhood sector. But we saw the influence earlier, and this is part of the history. In 2008, we got, so the 2008 regulations. In the lead up to that, I was involved in making comment on this. We were trying to get these regulations improved for space, mm -hmm. but we were told that the regulation review had to be cost neutral. So if you ask for something like more space or more washing basins per children per child, um, it, you couldn't do that because it's going to cost more money. You, so you first of all, we had for more space, but then you have to like compromise in another area. Is that what you're saying? Like, yeah, we'll give you more space, but then you're going to have to let go of the teacher ratio or something like that. Was that kind of the? Wasn't it wasn't handled that way. It was just off the table. Right. If it's going to cost money, we're not looking at it. 
And the, um, the, two point, the two point five square meters that we currently have in our regulations was that something that was carried on from nineteen eighties, nineteen nineties to today, or is that something that's shifted along the way? That, that number, two point five inside and five outside, comes from nineteen eighty five. Right. But the big surprise in two thousand and eight is that without any notification of this change, because there would have been reaction against it. There was the number wasn't changed 2.5 inside, but one word was deleted from legislation the word furniture. So it was free of furniture, fixtures, and fittings. The word furniture was quietly taken out, and that would only have been commercial influence. There's no other reason to do I, that. By stealth, essentially, we've lost 10%, even worse. So that, that by stealth. We've kind of like ten percent. So, so yeah. on on a baseline that was poor, we have through the two thousand eight regulations actually lost another ten percent because of that kind of mm. deletion of the word. Yeah. Um, can you can you give me context? What are some of the um, overseas minimum indoor um, area and outdoor spaces? Just so we can understand where we're sitting in New Zealand. Well, there is a broad range. So um, one of the worst in the world is the UK. Mm -hmm. So. They're actually a little bit worse than ours, but numbers-wise, we are definitely near the bottom. Um, there's not a lot of jurisdictions that would go below 2.5. Um, I did a comparison that, uh, well, first of all, I, I had used OECD data, but one of the things I've become increasingly aware of is that OECD data can be very inaccurate, and it, these right. desktop exercises, often the data is quite faulty, depends where they get it from. And um, so I did my own search. Now, it takes a lot of time right. to, to find English language um, websites that show the documents. Sometimes you're finding PDFs. Sometimes it's right. um, you know, a, a nice government website. But um, matching the language, because of that difference, you see you've just got that term furniture taken out. So when I said the other on um, breakfast, then in Australia, it's 3.5 square metres compared with our 2.5. That's not the number. The Australian number is 3.25. Right. But the difference is that when um, Australia refers to free floor space, what they're actually meaning is free floor space. That's right. the difference. Without tables, without furniture, it's the free play space, which is a significant Yeah, so if you can match that up, then the real... The real number is more like 3.5, 3.6. So what I was saying was actually a slight, it's mm. the conservative comparison. Right. Now, I found that number was quite common through a number of, of US states. Um, and there's, a, there's differences in age group range. Um, some places give more space to under twos. Mm -hmm. um, some give less. And this depends on your comprehension of the needs of very young children. Um, toddlers need space. They need safe space to move because they're just learning to control those legs, for goodness sake. You know, they're, they're like learner drivers. <laughs> and, the, and they want to feed if they can, too. And they yeah. The, yeah. The, what about, there's, there's a lot of talk in our sector around uh, is it better to have uh, higher adult to teacher ratios or group sizes better? You know, and I want to touch, it's interesting, you, you're giving us really good context for where we've come from. Mm. Do you have any kind of insight into how, like, group sizes and as well as uh, adult to children teachers that you kind of can weigh in on? Yeah. Okay. Well, this was tackled in 19, um, sorry, 19, uh, 2018 when we did um, a presentation at the University of Otago. And what we were doing was we were looking at some claims. Sorry, this is getting into a bit of a challenge here, but we've already done the challenge. It's already out there to Ministry of Education claims, top three in the world for ratios, among the highest standards in the world for early child education. These were completely false statements. Right, so they've come out and said, this is our top, we're, we, we are proudly in the top three of these things. And you, you examined the statements and what did you find? Uh, at the time, I did less than an hour on the net and found 10 jurisdictions better than ours for ratios. Okay. I then spent more time and found 20. And I would be surprised if we're in the top 30 for ratios. Um, particularly for under twos, with a one to five ratio. And this has been recognized in the strategic plan that our ratios for under twos and under threes 
are poor. And this, I'm so glad they're looking to change it, but it's a desperate, urgent need as soon as we possibly can. And actually, this is where what we're headed into with the projected situation post COVID-19, the recovery time, the reality is sadly, we're gonna see a lot of people unemployed or in part-time employment. And it actually gives us the space, literally the space, to shift some of our standards so that they're actually more beneficial for children because we can start reducing child hours. It's the child hours, not necessarily the number of children. We don't have to have all our children in full daycare. We can start moving back towards sessional and that gives us space to move on the current budget without having to increase the budget. I, I we I'm just looking at time and I, and uh, one of the there's, there's still so much I want to cover so I want to kind of just uh, zoom in on a on a couple of things. Um, two things that you've published which is really interesting. Number one is um, uh, a kind of like a moonshot hypothesis of a different model which I'd like to go into which is the two eight home based model, uh, and then the other um, what other thing that you have also talked about is a different way of running the whole sector which yeah. actually tends towards um high quality independent <clears throat> kind of uh, so i'm going to touch on both of those but can we let's go back into um alternatives so we talked about uh, yeah. the the problems of the sector but what's the, what's the some alternatives that you can kind of talk to us about i i I'd just like to point out we have been to the moon um <laughs> We sure have. Yeah, and we can go to the two to eight model. In fact, we can go to it um, practically and relatively easily. Um, so this proposal, uh, New Zealand is is unusual in the world for restricting home based to the one teacher four child model. And you know, I mean, we're moving towards uh, towards um, better qualifications and home based, but that one to four model still is is very limited, and so. This proposal is simply to go to a two-teacher, eight-child model, which is, which is quite common around the world, or, or actually bigger numbers than that, but I would stop at two to eight. Now, just to give you a comparison, this house behind me, this is a modest 1960, well, it's an average 1960 house. It's 125 square meters. I have 40 square meters of, if you like, available living space, um, the room I'm in now, you know, take out the kitchen because that wouldn't be access space. Um, so if 40 square metres for eight children, that's five square metres per child. Mm -hmm. uh, take off 10%, 4.5. Right. Much, much better than minimum centre-based. Because one of the first reactions I had from people, funnily enough, was, oh, eight children, that's a lot. This space, um, that same space, the ministry would licence for 14 children. My, our, my garden out here, my half a quarter acre section garden, the ministry would license for 100 children. The grass is gone, it's dead. You can't have that at that density, but that's five square meters per child. That's what it does, it kills environments. And you know, one of the things that, um, oh, I wish I had more time, but in, when I'm doing design work, because I do outdoor area design um, when I get a chance to amongst PhDs and everything else, um, and, you know, we have this tragedy of children being told that they can't run outside, you could use your walking feet, because there's no space to run. But one of the things I do in design is I say, look to the experiences first, and, and very quickly, it's not just running, it's the joy of running, that's the experience, you know. <laughs> so um, so a, using the two to eight model, you, you can start picking up infrastructure that is available to us, which is a whole lot of houses around the country, in streets, connected in communities. And you can do things like, you can bring someone in. Um, so if you have, what I was proposing is that you must have at least one teacher trained. But you can bring another teacher in training, bring another person in training to be a teacher. Oh, but look at who you can draw from. Do you have um, a community that has um, is weighted towards a Chinese community or maybe um, a refugee community? You've got cultures, you've got language. Now you can have someone from that community come in alongside the trained teacher. You might have a person who's got 
particular expertise in developmental um, issues or maybe uh, maybe autism um, or or other things where you've got particular needs for children that need an answer. You can bring that expertise in into the two to eight model. So much you can do with it, and um, and so I I could see that if this was properly funded, not not the poor funding that we've had for home based, it could be almost like the gold standard model, and it's perfectly doable. That's it. We've um, I used to uh, in our, in the organisation I ran previously, uh, we had a nationwide home based model, and, and we supported children who were in transitional oranga tamariki care and yeah and everything and the the joy in the stories that we would see and the wellness of our our educators and our and our teachers was quite phenomenal and i know that it, quite a few of our teachers would do this two by eight model by stealth because they would have a friend who's down the road and they would uh, get together and and you know they might uh, report in an individual homes but essentially they'd, they'd stay together yeah. And those were the those were the ones who were sustainable in the home based um, sector for sure, and the the cross connection that yeah. came was was massive. I, I want to just quickly interject here, and yep, um, Penny got me into onto a book called Hold On to Your Kids by Gabor Mate, and I've mentioned him a couple of times on this broadcast, and he makes the case that this horizontal peer to peer kind of connection transmission basis that we've come into in the industrial school um, era where we send a six year old with a hundred other six year olds and like three adults or in our yeah. example we've got 22 year olds in one room yeah. is so against our biology and so against what um, how we have been designed to function that it yeah. completely stunts emotional growth and essentially the two-year-old is teaching the two-year-old how to handle massive emotions it's a it's a joke to think that just putting two or three adults in the room running around trying to uh yeah. you know squat you know little emotions is actually going to create a vibrant community of the the, the tribe of old yeah. so what i do love about what you're saying is that um you know you might have eight children but they're together and they are um, effectively in a mixed age setting where, where yeah. there is a significant amount of tuikana taina happening. And, um, and, yeah. and in one of our new center designs that we're, we're looking at is we've really tried to think outside the box, like how do we actually bring something that's similar to your 2.8 model, but create really small uh, home pods of mixed ages, right? Yeah. That, yeah. that then... Um, that when they come into the center, they stay with us for four years in that, in that kind of community. And there's, you know, so anyway, it, it requires us to really, I think what you're getting us to do is to go, look, guys, it's actually just not okay. <laughs> what we have right now is not okay. And it requires a combined voice and it requires some innovative thinking for us to solve problems. Yeah, is that totally, totally. Look, to me, one of the greatest frustrations right now um, is... You know, like a couple of years ago, as these models were coming together, we were discussing, because I've discussed these models all around the country, two to eight, and the quality-based contracting, which I'll describe briefly in just a moment. You know, looking at these things, we thought, listening to the government, they will have big smiles on their faces when we put this to them, you know. Um, you know, Jacinda Ardern was wanting it to be the best place in the world to be a child. And the things that Chris Hipkins was saying around what he wanted to see in the sector, things he was concerned about, and I thought, we have got the answers. They're going to love this. We haven't had any conversation yet. We just can't get to the minister. Absolutely blocked. And I'm sorry to say this, just as, because there is a little bit of a problem in the processes here. The 2 to 8 model went through as a submission for the home-based care review and was quietly binned by the Ministry of Education. It didn't get to the Minister and Cabinet. It wasn't even seen. We do have to address the problems in the way that the ministry handles some of these things. And I'm sorry, I didn't want to bash the ministry today. No, but I understand. Yeah. And, and I think what's interesting is when I looked at what's happened, and we, we're going to come to um, just a little bit of, of your interaction with the media in the last few yeah. days, yeah. is that um, your, your article in New Zealand Herald outlined some really clear areas where, where we need to ensure that, that we do better in. Um, and maybe two or three of them, there's been some, uh, there hasn't been a full embrace, but there's been some 
like concessions. Like we've gone from two and a half square meters to three. You rightly point out that that would still be uh, overcrowding, but yeah. there's, there's like, it's call it value signaling or whatever. It's something. Uh, they've also gone from 16 degrees to 18 degrees, which um, uh, is maybe yeah. a temporary measure. Yeah. What's that, sorry? What they didn't recognize is that most centers can't do that. The problem well, is exactly what my thought was is like they were set up from an infrastructure point of view to be yeah. 16 degrees. How all of a sudden are they going to get to 18? But anyway, and then um, there was there's perhaps one or two other points that they kind of touched on, but it does seem I uh, yeah, I, I just want to see where I want to go from here because yeah, I want to I want to move towards and I think we're going to have you on. A broadcast again, Mike, because we really want to go into um, the quality base indicators in more detail, and we might touch on it briefly. But with a separate session, yeah, because there's a yeah, lot. I think so. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question: seventy percent. You you identified in a survey of three hundred teachers that seventy percent of them either felt stressed or overstressed in their jobs. We we uh, had that was um, that was teachers advocacy group. And by the way, um, huge thank you. To the work that Susan Bates and does in Teachers Advocacy Group, um, I just want to mention that just as I came from public health into early child education, Susan came from the education side and has really, really worked into health. Um, has done a stunning job, and she's the one who ran that survey. It was just, and this is all voluntary, by the way. Great. Enormous amounts of hours voluntary. So, a huge thank you to Susan. Yeah. What, uh and many of us might be feeling fairly burnt out. And hopefully um, what we're doing here at Conscious Collective is helping um, everyone kind of dial into their own emotional wellness so they can they can show up. But that's never going to never going to change the environment and the storms around us. But what hope do you have for teachers who are facing having to go back to yeah. same regime and kind of, to be honest, feeling a little tired of the chat? Yeah. Um, the the thing that I still want to try and push for is to have that level three access, and it should be level two as well, limited to absolute need. The key to being able to handle this is keep the numbers down. That's your number one intervention, just keep the numbers down. And that's why I've said this is um, poor public health advice, because you've got your one key intervention here that you can use, and level three and level two that is not being used, which is to limit the numbers. So um, that's that's the suggestion they to make to centre owners um, and to teachers to put this to their centre owners is try not to have children attending for parents who do not have to go out to work. Um, I know that there's a, there's a lot of technology. Sorry, Mike, there was a language change that shifted um, uh, from voluntary uh, attendance to only those of essential services and those uh, who need to go back to work and does not have alternative uh, ability to care. And I okay. do want to advise our um, our centres in Level 3, which I feel like is almost starting to get close to what you're saying, is that <laughs> for our managers and for our teachers ensure that that is a strong stance that you take because I feel like that is the protection you're talking about levers that we can pull is um and then for me from a courageous side and a side of, of turning up to the front lines is if these people really need to get back to work and they are so void of village support right now that they don't have anyone else who could literally look after their child mm. yeah the, I, mean, I, I do see the value in the ethics of turning up yes the um when I did the the Herald article um, the position that I took was that it should be not essential workers. That was actually not my heading. Um, right. The words that I used, the children for of parents for whom it is essential, that was my wording. So right. that was level three and level two. So it says, to, you know, whichever, whatever the status is for people going to work, it's only for the parents for whom this is essential. Now, hopefully we're heading towards that now. To me, that's the most sensible thing to do. And I also put that to Michael Baker, um, Professor Michael Baker, the epidemiologist, yesterday. He said, yes, that's absolutely sensible. So um, if we can stick to that, then the next things that we look at are 
um, trying to maintain that group size. So we talked about bubbles, but what you want is to try and go to the smallest group size you can. Now, obviously, the fewer children you have attending, the more you can limit the group size. The thing that worried me is the difference between different centres around the country, that you might have one that has no parents who have to go to work, and you might have another where because of the um, location, perhaps it's related to a particular business environment, that they could be near full. And so um, that's where we really needed limits around ratios. So I still want to appeal to the Ministry of Education to put those limits around ratios that I had suggested. Um, and in actual fact, their group size, if they're saying limit group size 10, that matches reasonably well to what I'd said. Um, when I said, look, the clear message from the sector is don't open, the reason I said that is because that was the clear message from the sector, and I respect that. I'm really upset that the sector, I, I'm, not the, I'm not the sector, I'm just one person. You know, when 90% of the sector says don't do this, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to listen to them. But they haven't been listened to, so now we've got to go back to that position of saying, okay, well, what was the next best advice? And that's where I put mine, is actually the next best advice. Mm -hmm. um, we say, okay, we've got to do this, how are we going to do it? Um, so yeah. um, the, the people who are going back to work, right? Mm. This is the reality for many of us right now, next uh, Wednesday. Yeah. Um, and it may be two weeks, it may be four weeks. Uh, mm. One thing I want to get your opinion on is um, I think that the government has been prudent in the sense of assessing community transmission um, and and their, uh, the the what do they call it, the silent transmission of, of that and the possibilities of that being kind of going, going forward. Is that your view or do you have a different view on that? I do have a different view. Um, yeah. Um, so there's two sides to this. The first is that our situation in terms of presence in the community, as far as we know, um, that is looking like we're in a very good situation. So the reality is that our, our nationwide risk levels at the moment are well down. The chances of having a child come along infected with COVID-19 are pretty slim. Right. And that's what Level 4 has done. So that was really good. We did so well up until now. We were tracking along really well. The, the difficulty is that this suggestion that you don't have asymptomatic spread is just poor science. We, we don't really have the measures on that. It doesn't stack against what we're seeing in the rest of the world. And I'm sorry, I have seen the Ministry of Health give shockingly bad advice to the sector over the years. You know, we had a poster on the wall in early childhood centres for 15 years that had bad advice that was a recipe for an outbreak. It's a government department. It's not a university. It's not a scientific institution. It's a government department. So I'm sorry, I don't agree with them. And I do think that we should have given more weighting to the risk of asymptomatic spread. So I'll hold my position on that one. I, yeah. I don't think they got that right. Um, right. All we can do now is to say, let's do the best that we possibly can with this situation, keep the numbers to a minimum, minimum ratios to a maximum, group size to a minimum. But when I say ratios to a maximum, maximum we've got another problem. Because in that survey of 3,500 teachers, half of the teachers identified that either they or a member of their household was at elevated risk for COVID-19. In other words, they shouldn't be there. So you can pretty, you know, in that respect, there are a lot of teachers who should be able to say, I'm sorry, this is not safe for me right now. And I don't want to see those teachers told, well, you've got to turn up for work anyway. Because we do have to consider that we have some beautiful, wonderful employers and we have some bad ones. We've got to protect the teachers against the bad employers in the sector and to say a big thank you to the good ones. And so the, the, that last point is where we're going to outro in because um, uh, you have got a model that proposes how we can actually increase the well-being for our children and our t teaching staff yes. um, and protect us from bad employers and yes. bad employers becoming a high growth um, organization. Yes. And so it's a very interesting paper. We can, we can people, um, we're going to, like I said, we'll have you on again and we're going to get yeah. down into detail, but where mm -hmm. can people find your work? 
because yeah. um, I've read through your research, I've read through your submissions for um, strategic uh, task force. I think it's brilliant. And um, what I'm what I'm noticing is that collective action is important, right? Yes. Yes. And I here's here's my here's my view, and this is my this is my uh, kind of like a request for our teachers. Mm is that perhaps what we can do is we can write an open letter to Jacinda and, and Minister Hipkins, not as a temper tran tantrum, because temper tantrums never get anything done, but as a message from the front line. Yeah. And when we speak, we don't speak as politicians, we speak as family. Yes. And we remind them that our sector is indispensable. The very ones that, that, that's been last on their agenda are now the ones they're calling to be first. And we remind them that using election cycles to buy votes will no longer do, and that immediate action is needed to improve yeah. our working conditions. We remind them that we will be courageous, uh -huh. and we remind them that we play the, the crucial role that we play in, uh, in, in for our generations. We'll remind the New Zealand public that essentially we're the villagers. We're the village that's helping them uh, raise sure. their children together. Yeah. And for me... Uh, when we turn up and we write this love letter to our children and to our politicians mm. from the front lines, out of courage, yes, I feel like right now there's a time that it will not fall on deaf ears because mm. love, as you mentioned, my friend, is the only force that I think can take on the feeling of betrayal and actually yeah. win. So perhaps. <laughs> Now is an opportunity where we can put language as a sector. Maybe we've got some amazing copywriters and we can outline like this is the like it's time to not ignore the sector and we put something in front of them. That's just spitballing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. And um, the thing, again, the message I want to put to um, particularly to our politicians is that we have some beautiful <laughs> answers to this. It's not just a case of correcting the bad. The things in the two to eight model and the quality based contracting model, there's really, really nice things in there. And they are absolutely workable. Um, we just want to get them across. We want to be heard um, and to be able to say, look, there's there's actually an opportunity in front of us, sadly caused by the impact of COVID-19, that actually has given us a circuit breaker um, on on the pressure on the sector. Reducing child hours is an amazing circuit breaker to give us room to move. And this is the time, if there was ever a time to start changing what we're doing for better, we can do it now. We have answers. Totally. We, we can make it so positive. Where can we find your work, Dr. Mike? Okay. So the, the quickest access at the moment, um, I'm sorry, we, we were going to have a website for this and, and all that arrangement got sat on by COVID-19. That's right. Um, we can potentially put it up on our, on our website if you want or our Facebook page, but another another mechanism? I'll write it to you. Um, the quickest at the moment would be the Teachers Advocacy Group Facebook page. Um, okay. So if you click into the, it's open access, go into Teachers Advocacy Group, you'll see on the right-hand side it's got documents on there, um, and you'll see the quality-based contracting model and the two-to-eight model. Um, you will also find it by going into uh, whatever it was on Facebook that's got the files on, on the left-hand side of their site. I think it's files. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can find it on their site. Um, and, um, yeah, um, you, if people want to email me for a copy, they can. I'd better just men mention that, yes, I am working three days a week for Massey University in a different job. So... Please, if you have emailed me, personal messaged me, think on Facebook, I am currently struggling <laughs> to answer. Mm -hmm. So please be patient with me. I hate not answering people. But I yeah, think if you can, can, I think we can all give you that, that grace right now, given the circumstances. Yeah. For sure, yeah. and we'll, we, might, uh, we might get those documents up on our Facebook page if we can, and we'll, we'll, yeah. let, our, we'll let our audience know. Um, just quickly from us, uh, mm -hmm. if, um, if you guys are interested in getting the professional development certificates and all our broadcasts, which I think we're about 80% there and actually uploading them onto our online um, learning platform, just follow that link below, get in touch, private message us if you um, on Facebook if you, if you need some support with that. 
Um, it's really great to just start building a community of passionate, heartfelt um, teachers who are going to continue to stand up for the well-being of our tamariki. Um, Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Mike. I really appreciate it. Um, this is going to be an ongoing conversation. I really um, want to honor you for the work that you've continued, continually done for us on behalf of all our kayako. Thank you, Rick. Thanks so much for the time. Okay. Ka kite. So,